Am I a spiritual baby? Do I still get angry at the same things I got angry about 20, 30 years ago? Do I still have the same patterns of life that I had when I first accepted Christ? According to the word we're going to use as a topic today, grow up. Grow up. And it's going to initiate the series step by step. Christian growth is necessary. Being a Christian is more than making a decision. It is more than accepting Christ. There must be daily growth. Those who do not grow in the Lord will find themselves drifting from the Lord and also from spiritual things. Peter tells us to grow in the Lord. In 2 Peter 3 and 18 it declares, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Once we become a Christian, there is no stopping place. We, this is a, a lifelong journey. Some people, again, think that once I've been accepted into the beloved, once I've admitted that I am a sinner, believe that Christ died for my sins and God raised him from the dead, and I've confessed him as my Lord and Savior genuinely and authentically, they believe that that's it. But, but once we get past that point, there is much work to be done. That work is manifested within the confines of the local church. He has called the church and commissioned the church to baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And also teach to observe all things. And he said he would be with us throughout that process. And so in order for us to grow, we have to remain connected to the Lord first, but connected to the church. Because a lot of people have online pastors that, that are teaching all kinds of different things. It's like the wild, wild west. You don't know if they believe in Calvinism or Armenianism. They believe in once you're saved, you're always saved. They believe you can, they can, you can lose your salvation. There are people that come from all kinds of different backgrounds, but people now don't take the time to read people's articles of faith, what their belief system is. And they listen, they listen, they listen. And before you know it, they are deceived. They're confused. They're perplexed. The church is primary job is to rightly divide the word of God to equip the saints to help the saints find out what their gifts are their skill sets are to to find a place to line up and to get in alignment with God's will and purpose for their lives so that they can hear him say someday well done thy good and faithful servant You've been faithful over a few things, and now I'm going to make you ruler over many things. And, and I know that we're not homesick. Yes, we're not looking forward to that today, but there's going to be someday. There's an appointed time for us. Our lives are but a vapor. Our days are numbered. Our steps are ordered. No man knows the day. No man knows the hour. We are to work while it's day because night comes when no man or woman can work. And systematic theology, ecclesiology is the study of the church. The purpose of the church gathered is for the church to come to maturity. Many activities are noted in the gathered church to accomplish this end. Teaching is one of them. Teaching is the Greek, it's didasko. It means to impart skills or knowledge to. And we know that there are people in the world that can impart skills and knowledge to do somewhat terrible things. Some erroneous things, some things that destroy society, some things that destroy family, some things that if you apply them, you'll self-sabotage your future. But see, the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life 
and that you might have it more abundantly. And some people have a medial understanding of that text because they think that text is talking about getting a million dollars or having a mansion or having this, that, or the other. But abundant life means that when I get sick, I can pray for him to heal me. Yes, when, when I'm in a tight spot, he will show up as a very present help in the time of trouble. He will open doors for me when no man can shut. I might not have more than enough sometimes, but I always will have enough because he said, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I feel it right there. You ought to say, Lord, thank you. He's worthy of all the praise, honor, and all the glory. And so we are to, to, to contest those, those corrupt thoughts and those corrupt teachings that we, we are taught from day one. Some grew up in an environment that was unwholesome. Some had people close to them that were modeling things and some were abused as children. Some people have gone through things that they never brought upon themselves. And so the church, with the help of the Holy Spirit... It's to be the vehicle, the mechanism for God to put back together the saints that are broke, busted, and disgusted. You ought to say, Lord, thank you because you gave me back my self-worth. You gave me back my self-dignity. You gave me back my self-esteem. I'm so thankful that you're able to create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right. Is there anybody in the church? You don't mind praising God huh? because when he found you, you were in a mess. Huh? But he coupled everything together. He made a mess of peace. Out of your mess, you ought to say, Lord, thank you. Yes, members of the early church steadfastly devoted themselves to teaching the teachings of the apostles. They taught the doctrine of resurrection of Jesus Christ. They taught continually as they had opportunity. To the extent that the entire city of Jerusalem was saturated with the teaching about Christ and his atonement. The Bible says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And those are geographical locations. And how do we find the application in our contemporary lives? It goes out. So we have to start with our immediate family. Then we, we share with our friends, our colleagues, and, and those that we come into contact with. We cannot take for granted that the person sitting beside you in the church is saved. We have to be all about sharing the word of God, all about living the word of God. Because if you share it and don't live it, people will be so distracted by your behavior that they'll never take the time to listen to what you have to say. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to make sure that you're in alignment with God so people will take the time to respect you and listen to you. Amen. And somebody say, give me the strength, Lord. Yes. The heart of their message was that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the Christos, the anointed one. We know the Messianic prophecies that point to him being the Messiah. And we understand that we know that they taught that perpetually and continually. And that's why we're able to hold on to these doctrines and these belief systems. Because people were willing to lose their own lives. Why were so many of the early apostles willing to die? Let me tell you why. Because they saw Jesus before he died, and then they saw him when he was resurrected. When they saw him as he was resurrected, they knew that everything he said was true. But Jesus said, greater are those who do not see and yet believe. That's why we are saved through faith, and we have to understand that, 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 that just like they believe, we ought to believe too. And if it says it in the word of God, we ought to say that is the truth. And it's the truth that will make us free. Somebody say, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the heart of their message was that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Teaching the new believers resulted in their maturity. The goal of Paul's teaching was to present a believer mature in Christ. It should be the goal of us collectively. We should have the objective to see the people that we witness to, see the people that we know they were baptized at a young age. We know that they accepted Christ at a young age, but they are going astray, but we cannot give up on them. Let me ask you this. What if someone gave up on you? See, we act as if we have never done anything wrong. 
Sometimes we get titles and sometimes we put big hats on and sometimes we put three piece suits on and we don't remember the fact that our righteousness is but a filthy rag. You ought to say, Lord, thank you for your grace. And now I'm going to tell everybody. That you can limp and still praise God. That you can limp and still worship him. Because he'll help you to deal with you. But you got to bring it to him. And you got to call on the name of Jesus. You can't stop because you got a struggle. You'll never defeat the struggle if you stop assembling, learning, and applying. It's a process. Yes. It's a process. The teaching was to be an ongoing practice to succeeding generations. Failure to do so or failure to respond to teaching resulted in spiritual babyhood. Don't, don't look at your, your neighbor. Look at yourself. Am I a spiritual baby? Do I still get angry at the same things I got angry about 20, 30 years ago? Do I still have the same patterns of life that I had when I first accepted Christ? Am I still trying to hang on to disjointed and discombobulated relationships that are corrupt and entice me to go and stray to the left and to the right? Am I still tolerating that type of existence in my life? See, the sign of spiritual maturity is just like Christ hates sin. You ought to hate it too. He loves the sinner. But he hates the sin. Let me tell you why. Because he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. So all of your indiscretions, all of my father's indiscretions, all of my mother's indiscretions, all of my grandmother's indiscretions, and my grandfather's indiscretions, all the way back to Adam, Jesus carried them to the cross. It was sin that caused Jesus to be crucified. But he wants to help us to deal with sin. But the first point is, careless people in the 11th verse we see of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. The people didn't seem to listen. But why were they careless? They were non-spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14 declares, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And so a part of your growth and maturation process is you being able to make spiritual choices before you apply them physically. Your mind has to be transformed. You have to operate according to a biblical and Christian worldview. If this is not expedient to my growth, I'm willing to deal with my friends ostracizing me. I'm willing to wait a little bit longer if I don't cut a corner. I'm willing to do whatever is necessary to remain in compliance with God because I, it has been dropped down in my spirit He's given me revelation and impartation as the Holy Spirit has fused with my human spirit. And now my soul, which is the seat of my volition, my intellect, my emotion, my understanding has become influenced by the Holy Spirit. Now I can make choices that are empowered by discernment. I'm not just going along with the flesh. I'm not just going along with urges. I'm not just going along with what people tell me to do, whether it's on the internet or on television. I'm going to filter it through discernment. That's how you consistently operate on a level of maturity. Somebody say, help me, Lord. Not only were they non-spiritual, the natural man, they were non-interested. Oh, my goodness. Church folk, non-interested? Matthew 13 and 13 declares, therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Jesus spoke simply in parables and they couldn't understand. Why couldn't they understand? Because they had no interest. 
They didn't pray and ask God to give them understanding. They did not even attempt to deploy hermeneutics, which is the science of interpretation. They just sat there as if he didn't know what he was talking about. And sometimes people look at me the same way. So I can understand why Jesus felt that way. But my job is to rightly divide the word of God. And I can't control who receives it. I can't control who applies it. I can't control who walks in it. That's between you and the Lord. But your blood is not on my hands because I'm going to tell you the truth. Amen. 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 Who wants the truth? Amen. Yes, they were also noncommittal. Second Timothy 3 and 7 declares always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, the reason why they were ever learning and, and never coming to the knowledge of the truth is because they allowed Judaizers and, and false prophets and false teachers to have access to their eye gates and their ear gates. Those are the gates to your soul. You must understand that even when he creates in you a clean heart, your heart, the Bible says, is still desperately wicked. Not just wicked, but desperately wicked. Oh, I just feel it in my heart. Well, your heart might be deceived. Your heart could be wrong. Your heart could be out of compliance with God. Just because your heart is telling you to do it, it doesn't mean you should do it. People have blamed divorces on their hearts. People have left the church and blamed it on their hearts. People have left jobs and blamed it on their hearts. People have laid down so many things that God had ordained for them, preordained, predetermined for them. They laid it down because, oh, my heart wasn't in it. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. He did not sin. He accepted it. But emotionally, he wasn't like you and me. He knew everything he was going to have to endure. But our hearts oftentimes will compel us to take the path of least resistance. You have to go through some things. And I wish I could tell you that once you accept Christ, that everything is going to be easy. He didn't say it was going to be easy. He just said his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. So we have to yoke up with him spiritually. And yes, he'll walk with you. He'll talk with you. He'll give you everything you need every step of the way. Won't he do it? He'll build you up where you're torn down. He'll strengthen you where you are weak. He'll do everything that's necessary. He'll move heaven and earth to get you what you need. Yes, they were noncommittal. Jesus said the truth would set man free. John 8 and 32 declares, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Unless we know him, the truth, we won't understand spiritual things. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. They were none acceptance. These people walked in darkness. They, they refused truth. Jesus said man would love darkness rather than light. John 3 and 19 declares, and this is the condemnation that is the light, that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Yes, we have to allow him to shine his Shekinah glory. And if he does that, he will illuminate the path that has been predetermined for our story. Because in darkness, we can only see so far. But when God begins to show us what to do, he begins to lead us and he begins to guide us. He begins to help us. He begins to empower us. He begins to remind us that we can have a mountain move out of our way. A giant can fall before us. He will exalt valleys for us. He'll make crooked places straight for us. He will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we shall ask or think. According to the power that works in us. Yes. So we have to tap into his divine power, his divine glory. 
Yes, the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You can do what the world says and you can do what this person says and you can do what that person says. I, I'm going to do what thus saith the Lord. I, I'm going to apply these biblical principles to my life because the productivity of my purpose began to show up in my situation and show up in my circumstance. Final point is childish people. They were childish people. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. There was a lack of of development for though this time they ought to be teachers let me share some statistics with you some startling statistics less than five percent of American parents who claim to be Christians possess a biblical worldview less than five percent new research out of Arizona Christian University found that the research also shows most parents today hold a belief system that blends multiple worldviews. I've heard it myself, people talking about karma. That's not a Christian principle. That word comes from Hinduism, not from Christianity. So people say all kinds of things and people practicing witchcraft and roots and all kinds of different things. And that's how you can have a multiple and a multiplicity of worldviews, not just an alignment with the Word of God, because that's not in the Word of God. The research involves interviews with parents of children under the age of 13. It was part of the Center, Center's American Worldview Inventory for 2022. So we wonder why there's a cycle where you don't see, you see the young people in the youth group, but then once they become young adults, they disappear, and we have to find out and try to get them back in. But we thank God we have a good young adult group here. But that's not always the case. And this is not, you ought to say, they didn't poll me. But this is a poll that is a sample of what a lot of people are actually operating according to. So we have to understand that we have to have a biblical worldview, a Christian worldview. And in order to have a proficient biblical Christian worldview, I need to know what the word of God says. I need to know who I am in Christ Jesus. If I want to know how to be a father, I need to find out what the word of God says about being a father. If I want to be a good husband, I need to find out what the word of God says about being a husband. I'm not going to go survey somebody that's had five marriages and they're still blaming it on the women. So stable people, solid food brings to those who are full age. Full age is an adjective being, it means being at an advanced stage of spiritual development, usually as a result of experience, teaching, and in most cases, time. Carnal people don't want God's word. They want to go what they feel. An oak tree is strong because of its roots. It starts out as an acorn, very small. And Bartow is the city of oaks and azaleas. So we know that there are a lot of oak trees that are protected, that cannot be cut down. So they grow to be hundreds of years old. They deal with a lot of, think about the hurricanes they've had to deal with. Think about the storms they've had to confront. But the older they become, the deeper their roots grow into the ground. And so as people are running around trying to store up for the storm, trying to make sure they have everything they need in case the lights go out and some even travel away to get away from the storm, the oak trees are just steadfast. Yes, the limbs rock back and forth, but you never see a true oak tree. You never see the trunk go back and forth. A palm tree can bend and come back but an oak tree is steadfast. As you grow spiritually, as you get into the deep things of God, 
the storms may come. The wind may rage. But you can be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. See, the Lord died for your sins, but not only did he die. He rose on the third day with all power in his hands. He ascended back into heaven. He's coming back again. But he said, it is expedient that I go away, that I send you a comforter. The Holy Spirit came to teach you all things. He, he came to bring those things to your remembrance. He came to lead you. He came to guide you. He came to empower you to run through troops and to leap over walls. Is there anybody in the church right now? Huh? You had to grow up because of what you went through. Huh? You had to grow up because of what you didn't have. Huh? You had to grow up because of opposition. Huh? You had to grow up because of people mistreated you and did your wrong. Huh? You had to grow up because the people you thought would be there for you were not there for you. Is there anybody that had to grow up spiritually to survive? Huh? You ought to say it is in him that I live, move huh? and have my being. Huh? I dare you to praise God right now. Huh? I know what the word of God says. Huh? That's why I know the grass withers, huh? the flower fades, huh? but the word of God huh? shall stand forever. Huh? I'm going to continually huh? put on the full huh? arm of God. Huh? The the helmet of salvation, huh? the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the sword of the spirit, which is uh, the word of God, huh? the shield of faith so I can quench the fiery darts of the enemy, huh? the belt buckle of truth, huh? feet shod with the preparation huh? of the gospel of peace. Huh? I don't have anything to protect huh? my hinder parts. Huh? That's why I'm going to face it. Huh? I'm going to stand up to it. Huh? And my God is able huh? to give me the victory. Huh? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Huh? They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Huh? They shall run and not be weary. Huh? They shall walk and not faint. Huh? You ought to open your mouth right now and give God a praise. Huh? If he ever showed up for you, huh? give him a praise. Huh? If he's ever healed you, huh? give him a praise. Huh? If he's ever worked it out for you, huh? give him a praise. Huh? If he's ever given you double for your trouble, huh? you ought to give him a praise. Huh? If he's ever had to raise up a standard for you, huh? because the enemy was coming in like a flood through your money. Huh? The enemy was coming in like a flood huh? through your family. Huh? The enemy was coming in like a flood huh? through your job. Huh? But the Spirit of God raised up a standard. Huh? And the, they, the Lord said, hold on, devil. Huh? You better behave huh? because that's my child. Huh? You ought to say, I'm a child of God. Huh? I'm an heir of God and join heir with Jesus Christ. Huh? I'm done with the message. Huh? But I dare you to praise God right now. Huh? Praise God with expectation. Huh? Praise God with belief. Huh? Praise God knowing huh? that the best is yet to come. Huh? Your latter days huh? shall be greater than your former days. Huh? You ought to say, the best is yet to come. Huh? The best is yet to come. Huh? He's about to fix it. Huh? He's about to restore I declare and decree is already done. God bless y'all today. It's already done. It's already done. Why you wait on horses and while you wait on chariots? I'm gonna put my trust in the Lord. You ought to say I trust. I trust him, I trust him. Huh? You ought to say it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Huh? I'm done, but you ought to say it. it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. The Empowered Life is sponsored by Marcus D. Floyd Ministries and is possible due to the grace of God and the generosity and prayers of our partners. If you have been blessed by today's program, please visit us at MarcusFloydMinistries.com or call us toll free at 1-855-788-0299 to partner with this ministry as we influence the world for Christ. All gifts are tax deductible to the full extent allowed by law.